Hey. Why are you afraid of Halloween? Let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Yes, we are back. We are live. Sonship Realities. I call this one the Halloween special. Why are you afraid? Right, greetings and blessings at Adventist Night Energy. And for those of you who may not, who may be seeing me for the first time, my name is Zane. Zane as in Z A N E, Zane. Right, and I will be, well, actually, I'm one of the mentors here in Adventist Night Energy. And we are here tonight to speak about why are you afraid? The Halloween special. I name this one Halloween special for spite. <laughs> Cheryl, my beloved and most holy sister, how are you tonight? All right, Christopher Lee Dittmore. Blessings, bro. Pleasure to have you here tonight. John Prince John. Pleasure to have you here tonight also. I believe John Prince John would actually be would, would, would be joining us from um from India. So yeah, they're actually in morning period right now. I think they are nine and a half hours ahead of the Eastern Standard Time and twelve and a half hours ahead of the Pacific Standard Time. Yeah. All right. All right. Um sorry about that. Yeah, um, Chris, blessings and much love, brother. What's up? <laughs> yeah, my holy brother Juma, how are you? Pleasure to pleasure to have you here tonight again. It's always a pleasure to have you here, bro. And Michael Woodworth, pleasure to have you here tonight, sir. Actually, I haven't seen you in a good while. It's actually a pleasure to actually see you here tonight. All right, John Prince John is actually just giving me some idea with which we pass the time and that's eight AM in India. So that'll be eight AM Thursday morning. All right, so they they're already seeing Thursday. All right, so blessings, much love. You know what time it is? According to my brother Chris here, it's now boom time. <laughs> Right, boom time. So today I actually just sat down here. I was actually um um I intended to, to to come live to go live this evening, but I intended to actually go into the continuing the pray like a son, not like a servant series. As as, as I mentioned to you all, we I I would be alternating the pray like a son, not like a servant, and the eternal life series throughout this month. So. Tonight, actually, I, I did just this evening, I was actually sitting down and somebody asked me, Zane, why don't Christians celebrate Halloween? I'll say this now. That's, 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 so they asked me the question. So I actually started to try to actually um, explain to this person, you know, what's the difference between Halloween, the light and the darkness, right? And then, the topic came up after with regards to oh, how come you know, Christians are so afraid of Halloween. I know most of us here in Adventist identity may not fall into this category. But we cannot negate the fact that there are many of us that, that, that there are many of us who may know Christians, fellow Christians, who may who may be also who may be actually falling into the category of, of being fearful of Halloween tonight. A night that they actually say is the darkest night of the year. <laughs> right? Some of them actually are so afraid that they wouldn't allow their children to actually walk out into the road. Say, leave that devil business alone. We are not of that. <laughs> right? Just let me take a minute to, 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 to actually heal out Jennifer, holy sister. Blessings and much love. You know, we like to have you in the house. We like to have you in the house. 
my holy, most holy and beloved sister, Patei. Much love. Special love to you, my, my dear and beloved sister. Right. Sherry! What's up? <laughs> How are you? Pleasure to have you here tonight again. All right. Always a pleasure to have you, Tom, to have you guys joining in on the live. Yeah? Gonna take a sip of water before we get down to business. Yeah. Let me do this thing. <laughs> right? Yeah, first says that internet is working tonight. That is what we're talking about. That is what we're talking about. <clears throat> All right, so throughout this live tonight, I just actually want to make sure that um I don't move make too much of a sudden movements. So the last the last slide that we did apparently the sudden movements tend to trigger the pixelize um the, the pixeling the pixeling of the the distortion of the of the um of the image so i'll try to remain quiet tonight you know because that is for me <laughs> then when 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 we actually start to speak about christ when we actually start to speak about the realities of christ it's very difficult to actually stay still right right so i will be actually be following you Calling you all on my phone to make sure that my, my screen doesn't stick. Right, Bonnie Jean. Pleasure to have you here tonight, Holy Sister. Have me, I haven't seen you in a while. All right, Derek Kilbert. Welcome and blessings, Holy Brother. All right, so as I was saying, getting back to the conversation that I was having, this person actually asked me why Christians want to celebrate Halloween. And the, and the topic came up with regards to the fear that a lot of Christians actually have with regards to Halloween, right? The witches, the warlocks, the 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 tricking and the treating and the um, the incantations and the satanism behind it, right? And a lot of actually a lot of Christians actually tend to retreat. They tend to withdraw. So on Halloween night. They don't want to come out of the house because they don't want to catch something. They don't want to catch a little spirit. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so I said to actually to uh, um actually when 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 the topic came up, it, it reminded me of, of the topic this evening. I was reminded by father of the topic this evening. And I decided to see, see this. Let's tackle this subject. Right, because many of us actually live in a world where we have all of these things going on, different things taking place. These celebrations like Halloween, where it's considered to be the darkest night of the year, where it's actually you have the presence of of um, all things that pertain to things that are totally the opposite, or what may seem to be opposite from God. And people retreat, and the Christian Church, the sons of God actually find themselves not the sons of God in Adventist identity because we actually have tangible experience with Christ, with Father. So we ain't afraid of that, as we say in Trinidad. We ain't afraid of that. <laughs> All right? But there actually, um, there are actually a lot within the body of Christ, a lot of people within the body of Christ that are still walking in fear concerning this. So tonight, get ready. Get ready. And we're going to take that. We will drop a slap on that. And outside with that. Yes? Yeah? We will take that. We will wet it with our left hand. With our right hand. Then wet it with our left hand. Outside with that. <laughs> All right. So, um, to actually get this session, um, this, 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 um, this session rolling with regards to that perspective, that perspective that we actually must protect ourselves because this is a common concept within the within the body of Christ, the general, especially within 
the the denominational circles that we must protect ourselves from these things. That we should not mingle with these things. We should stay away. And so we and so many of them, many of them actually end up locking themselves away from the world to get away from the evil that is apparently running wild out there. And they don't want to be caught on the streets. They don't want to be caught in the celebration because that is devil thing. That is demonic. Right? And you actually could open doorways to the devil. Do you even watch the program? Or else you open a doorway to your home and devils could come in. And if you get possessed, and don't let the children see it either, because the, a doorway could, could open in them, in their lives. And these things could torment them. How many of us, have a, how many of us familiar with that mindset and that perspective? Type, no fear. If you're, familiar, if you're familiar with that perspective, type no fear. Mark, sup, Harry? <laughs> yeah, Elijah up here. You're welcome, Elijah up here. Yeah, and he's actually um, uh, my um, first cousin. Yeah, and even more than that, I call him a super bro, a super brother, <laughs> a supernatural brother. So if you're familiar with that, type no fear. If it sounds familiar. All right, Chris says no fear. Patty says no fear. Cheryl says yes, I'm familiar with it. Elijah says no fear. Jennifer says no, not familiar with it. You never say that, Jennifer? I'm not asking if you believe it, I'm just asking if you're familiar with it. If you're familiar with the, with the doctrine that these things are demonic and you have to hide and stay away from it. Right? That, that is what we are addressing here tonight. In this life, I right, sure says, so glad you're addressing this because many Christians are afraid of so many things. You. We could put that up on our banner. We need to get them, we need to shake them out of that mentality. Mark says, what's up, we'll touch. Hey, you're back on land, bro. That's what we're talking about. We will pick up soon. All right, Sherry says, no fear. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so. All right, Jennifer says, we don't participate or encourage. Okay, okay. Great. All right, so let's get across to Psalm 91, right? If you have your Bibles, your tabs, your laptops, excuse me, your, your desktops, go across to Psalm 91 for me. And you say we'll start this session tonight on Psalm 91. Now, why is he looking for that? Many, this, 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 arm, this, this perspective, this doctrinal perspective is something that has plagued the Christian body for a long time. Right, might I add? Let me just say this outrightly: that perspective is a lie from the pit of hell. It is a lie. The reason why that that exists within the denominational circles is because they actually have um, a knowledge of God, and I dare say this on a life publicly that the denominational circles have a knowledge of God that is very pagan. It is very, it is actually, it falls very squarely in the category of paganism. Yes, I said it. It's paganism. Uh, within the denominational circles, you actually hear a lot of, of, um, of, of perspectives. Like, you actually have to protect yourself and you can open doorways. And, um, they go on and on with regards to the perception or the perspective that you have to pray and, and, and actually protect yourself and keep the devil out. You have to keep the devil out. Yeah? And um, you have to pray and gain spiritual authority. 
come actually go so far to say that they actually need to you actually you have to um to gain um spiritual strength yeah these doctrines exist a dime a doctrine <laughs> right or a dime a hundred doctrines <clears throat> now that mindset in particular as i said i just want to reiterate it's more pagan more pagan than you can imagine right as a matter of fact if there's anyone and i say this openly also if a sickness meets the average denominational perspective the religious christian perspective of the demonic of the spiritual realm the satanist might think that he has met another witch or another warlock or a fellow satanist let me take a drink on that too yeah think about it right in this in this live i actually wouldn't go into the pagan perspective in much detail because we are actually speaking we actually here to speak about why are you afraid but i wanted to hold on to that because in the near future i'm going to do a live specifically on how pagan that perspective is and how the christian body actually are literally creating and stirring their own torment in that perspective all right but let's jump across to psalm 91. so the common idea is from these perspectives is that the devil is out there this is the general perspective that the devil is out there and you need to protect yourself and right? you must do nothing to open doorways you must it i just said that's harsh yeah bro it is what it is <laughs> right <clears throat> um the common perspective is that 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 the devil is out there and that this is the, the, the church talk that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and because of that the christians hide in their homes like birds in a cage afraid of the lion that is walking in the road because that lion can come to devour them that my holy siblings that my holy siblings is taken out of context all right but let's jump across to psalm 91 to see what is god's perspective what is the sons of god the sons of god for some reality in this all right so if you actually go across the psalm 91 i'm going to be reading from the all right so most of us are actually familiar with psalm 91 from the kjv the king james version so let's pay attention here i'm reading from verse one and it says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty i will say of the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my god in him will i trust surely shall he deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and buckler thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over thee charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways now i um we'll we'll, we'll stop at the next verse that says they shall bear thee up in their hands 
lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, scroll back up to verse 1. All right? And verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, in the last live that we did, we actually identified very briefly what was the secret place of the Most High. All right? For those of you who actually have not seen the last live, I will encourage you to go back to the last live that we did last week. Right? Regarding eternal life, we touched Psalm 91 and we identified what the secret place is. Right? So I would not divulge into that again. So I'll just actually go straight to what it is according to scripture. And if you desire, again, I say again, if you desire to get context as to how we have arrived at that, go back to the last life and, and, uh, and take a look at it and you will see it in that life. You will hear it, sorry. See and hear it in that life. All right? So identify that the secret place is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. How many of us remember that? Type spirit. If you remember that, type spirit. For those of you who are here, and right, I'm actually seeing Pastor John Ebenezer. Pastor John E. Pleasure to have you, and have you here. Well, I have to say good morning for you. To have you here this morning, sir. <laughs> awesome to have you here, bro. Frank Hanks is in the house. Pleasure to have you here tonight, bro. Great pleasure to have you here. Okay, my just they all just bear with me, my my for this this screen here. All right. Kelly Canvas is in the house also. Pleasure to have you have to have you here tonight, Kelly. All right, spirit. Awesome. So when we actually took a look at that last week. We said that this verse can then be read, He that dwelleth in the spirit of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We also covered within the last video, and within the last slide, that in Christ, you're actually dwelling in the spirit, and the spirit is light. So from the New Testament perspective, it would read, He that dwelleth in the, in the spirit of the Most High shall abide under the light of the Almighty. Yeah? Now, we also identify within that, um, within the last life, that the word spirit is actually misunderstood within the Western arenas. And we agree in that the word spirit, according to the ancient Israelite perspective, as well as it is this, this what, what we discussed last week is also included in the definitions of both the word ruach in Hebrew as well as pneuma in Greek. Right, we, we we mentioned that the common Western idea of a spirit is something that is it is something that is ethereal, that is not corporeal, that does not have a body. We have been taught by the Western world and by Hollywood, <laughs> right, by Hollywood, that these are ethereal beings that are walking around and entering and entering things. Right, the ancient Israelite perspective of spirit has nothing to do with that. That is, that is actually a Western fabrication. It is a Western concoction. Right? The word spirit, as we cover within the last life, we, we briefly touched this topic. We cover that the word spirit is actually energy. It's your, it is actually wind and breath. Right? That's why in the Gospels it says that, that Jesus gave up his spirit. He gave up the ghost. And, 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 and another disciple, and another um, writer in the Gospels, he actually said that he breathed his last breath, right? So Job 27 actually says that the Spirit of God is in your nostrils. So we know for a fact that Spirit is not this ethereal being. That is Spirit according to the ancient, the ancient Israelite perspective. And it's also referred to as energy. That is actually how your body functions with electricity. It has the electricity that allows movement of your heart has a heart, how it has an electrical pulse, and your brain function with electrical pulses. It actually, it, it actually functions with neurons. Right? So that's energy. And another, and, another, and another context which is included in the ancient Israelite context of the word spirit, which is very uncommonly heard within the Western arenas, 
is mental disposition, right? Mental being mind, thought, imagination. So when you hear within the Old Covenant that someone says that there's in the in the old in the Old Testament it is said that that this one this person actually had a spirit of jealousy. A spirit of jealousy came upon the person. It is not some ethereal being that actually just jumped on the brother. <laughs> right? It is actually specific to thoughts of jealousy that came upon the person. Right? You would notice that all through the Old Testament it says, My spirit is grieved, my spirit is troubled. Right? That is also written in the Old Covenant. It's referring to thoughts. Right? So we, we mentioned that your, your secret place is the Holy Spirit, and we identify that spirit also includes mental disposition. Mental is equal to mind, mind is equal to thought, thought, thought is equal to imagination. Right? If you're following that, type holy. I'll just give you a brief rundown of what we covered, the, the concepts that we covered there within the last session. If you're following that, type holy. Right? Let's see why you are not, it is illogical for the sons of God to be afraid. Completely logical. Let's see why. All right, if you're following that type holy. Yeah. Chris says, yes, yes, Chris. That's exactly it there, bro. <laughs> All right, and it goes deeper than that with regards to spirit. But this is not the life of that. Let's stick to the to the context here before we stay at three hours. You know how we just go long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys are saying holy, holy, holy. That's what we say. Nice. So, therefore, as we covered, just to recap the last part of what, what the, of the context of the word spirit here, we said that Psalm 91 can be read He that dwells in the mental picture of the Most High shall abide under the light of the Almighty. Right? It's, he goes on to say also, I will say of the Lord. Now, in Second Second Corinthians chapter 6, Paul actually said that the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Therefore, you can actually read the, old, read the Psalms, for example, and where you see Lord, you can interchange it with Spirit. And it will read, I will say of the Spirit of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. I say again, that can, if, if um, Paul in the Second Corinthians actually said that the Lord is the Spirit, therefore we see Lord in the, in the Psalms, for example, you can interchange Lord and put Spirit or Spirit of the Lord, and it would read, I will say of the Spirit, or I will say of the Holy Spirit, or I will say of the Spirit of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Right? So we are actually speaking about the spirit. The second thing that we actually want to identify here, which is very, very instrumental with regards to why it is illogical for you as a son of God to be afraid of Satan, is it actually says in verse 2, He is my refuge and my fortress. What is a refuge? Now, if you all actually Google, for those of you who have never thought about what I'm asking you here, if you actually Google, you'd realize that a refuge and a fortress is actually all English for a particular structure that a city would actually use, and that, that, that's, that a people, uh, a city would actually build a fortress where in war, the, the inhabitants can actually stay on the inside because the fortress is extremely strong. It's built with walls that are feet in thickness, with a, with a, with a, with a large door that usually has to be chained down to come inside. <laughs> All right? If you actually don't have a visual as to what a fortress is, based on my explanation, I suggest that you just open a tab, a separate tab, on your on on your laptop, on your phone, or 
or even on your on your um, on your computer and Google a fortress or refuge it's actually one and the same it says my refuge and my fortress that in Hebrew text is actually called a couplet where the right where the writer is actually saying the same thing in two different ways refuge fortress is the same thing All right so it says, I will say of the spirit he is my refuge and my fortress my God in him will I trust or do you realize that what this Psalm 91 is actually saying, one, that the secret place is the Spirit of the Lord, which we understand, which we understand is thought or mental picture of the Most High. And what is the mental picture of the Most High? That is, that, that, that is my first question. It says, he that dwells in the secret place or in the spirit or in the mental image of the Most High shall abide under the light of the Almighty. What is the mental picture of the Most High? We know that faith, for those of you who have actually listened to the faith session, the by faith session, or even the wonder working faith session in the Nine Gifts series that was done very recently here within Adventist Night and Duty, we identify that faith is mental acceptance as being true or real. Mental equals mind, mind equals thought, thought equals imagination. Therefore, faith is thoughtful or imaginative acceptance that something is being true or real. Therefore, if we have in faith, Faith comes with a mental picture. What is the mental picture? What is the mental picture of the Most High? All right, give me a quick answer. What is the mental picture of the Most High? The answer to this is also in the Psalms. Hey, Pauline, blessings, Holy Sister. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. All right, what is the mental picture? I'll tell you what the mental picture is. Go across to Psalm 27. Just quickly jump across to Psalm 27 for me. But he says, bright light. Ding! That's what we're talking about. Party is on the ball. <laughs> right? Go to Psalm 27 verse 1. For those of you who may be hearing this for the first time, you will not say that Zane making this up. All right? Psalm 27 verse 1 reads, right, you have two seconds, one, one and a half, one and three quarter, one and nine tenths, <laughs> and two, let's go. All right, so Psalm 27 verse 1 reads, the Lord, now we mentioned, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Pause. Go back to the top of the verse. It says, the Lord, now we mentioned just now that Paul in 2 Corinthians actually said that the Lord is the Spirit. So let's interchange Lord and put Spirit. The Spirit is my light. The Spirit is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I say? So he's asking based on his statement. Who do you have to be afraid of? The spirit is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Right? In other versions, it says the spirit is the fortress of my life, which is also accurate. So what is your mental picture of the Lord, of the spirit? Light. Yeah? Light. Now, if you're hearing this for the first time, or you just pause, don't beat up too quickly. <laughs> right? don't, don't try to respond too quickly. Let's, let's see what the spirit is. Just think about it. So the scripture is actually telling you that your mental image of the Lord or of the spirit of God is light. The spirit of the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? If you're following that, type light. Let's do that quickly so I know that you're actually keeping up with what, with what we're speaking about. If you're following that, type light.
Yeah, I just, just want to make sure that everybody's following. Nice. Light. 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 That's what we're talking about. All right? So if we see in Psalm 27 when it says that the Spirit of God is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Spirit of God is the strength of my life or the fortress of my life. In other words, according to what we're actually reading here, if you go back to Psalm 91, it says, He that dwells in the Spirit of the Most High, in the mental image of the Most High. Therefore, in other words, we can actually say that He that dwells in the mental image of the light of the Most High shall abide in the light of the Almighty. If you're following that, type bright light. <laughs> Super light, that's what we're talking about, Patty. Yes, Holy Sister. All right, you're following that type bright light. So I'm reading it again while I say type in that. It should read, He that dwells in the mental image of light of the Most High shall abide under the light of the Almighty. As the first thing I want to actually show you concerning that now. Bright light, bright light. Amen. <clears throat> now, do you realize that in Psalm 27 verse 1, it says, The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is my light and my salvation. Right? The word salvation there also means deliverance in the in, in the context of that verse, according to the to the to, to the translation of, of of the word actually translated as salvation. It also means deliverance. Now pay attention to what this verse is saying. It says the Lord, the, men, the Spirit of the Lord, or the mental image of the Lord is my is light. Is my He is my light and my salvation, which is my deliverance. Whom shall I say? The Spirit of the Lord. So, yeah, sorry, the Spirit of the Lord or the mental image of the Lord is the fortress of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? There's that, there's that question. Why are you afraid? See, according to Psalm 27 verse 1, it gives a very clear understanding and a clear key as to what is your protection. And according to Psalm 27 and Psalm 91, your protection is actually your mental image of the Lord. For spirit is referring to the mind. Your mental, your your thoughts, right? Your thought of 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 the Holy Spirit being a, um, a fortress is being light, but He's not only light; He is a fortress of light. Your fortress of light. In other words, pause for a moment, giving thought to what the Psalm is actually saying. That he that dwells in the mental image of the light of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Sorry, under, under the light of the Almighty. I will say of the Spirit of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Now pause for a, for a moment and give that thought. Right? Imagine that you are in the middle of a massive fortress. And this fortress, the substance of this fortress, is not dust or brick. The substance of this fortress is the Holy Spirit manifested as light. So think about it. Right? According to the psalm, he that dwells there in that same place that I'm telling you to go right now in your mind, Is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and abides under the light of the might of the Almighty. According to the Amplified Bible, you are actually dwelling in the light of the Almighty, in whose power no enemy can withstand. Yeah, see, Jesus said that you are the light of the world. <laughs> right. So according to scripture, the sons of God are now light. Now in the last 
life, we also we also in the, we also we also identified that you were born of God. And John in First John chapter one verse five literally said that the Lord that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. Therefore, if you are born of God, you are born of light, and in you there is no darkness. Right? So I'm, I'm actually laying this foundation because I'm going to go in a direction to show you how illogical it is for the sons of God to be light and to be afraid of Satan. It's totally illogical. Right? It goes on to say that you are the light. Of, he went, um, sorry, he went on to say, he went on to say, Jesus went on to say that you are the light of the world. Pay attention to what he's saying. You are the light of the world. Right? Now, now that we've established that, jump across to, to me to Psalm 84. Right? We're going to come back to Psalm 91. But I want you to go to Psalm 84. All right, I'll give you two seconds again. If you're in Psalm 84, scroll long to verse 11. What does it say? It says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he uphold from them that walk uprightly. In this verse, let's take out the word Lord again and put Spirit. For the Spirit, God, is a son, not S O N, S U N, and a shield. That's a couplet in the Hebrew language. Couplet, son, and shield. They're actually saying the same thing using two words. Therefore, the parallel is that the God is a son, and a, a, which is a shield. Now pause for a moment right there. And is, can anyone here actually tell me when was the last time somebody journeyed to the sun? Nobody answer yet? <laughs> when was the last time was somebody did somebody journey to the sun? If you attempt to approach the sun, what happens? Type it, in, type it in the chat window. If you attempt to approach the sun, what happens? And while you're writing that, I want you to take note of the fact that according to First John, you are born of the same God who is the sun, as well as the fact that Jesus said that you are born of the spirit of God, who is his son, an S-U-N, not an S-O-N. So you are, so you are S-O-N, that is an S-U-N, a son, that is a son. <laughs> what happens if you are trying to approach the son? It will kill you. Yes, Jennifer. All right? Sherry says it will burn you up. Yes. Chris says it will fry you. You will be fried. Oh, you'll be fried properly. <laughs> right? And it says burning rings of fire. Yeah? Cheryl, Cheryl says it will burn. Exactly. See? Pause for a moment and think about what we are actually saying. The Spirit of God is a sun. A S-U-N. And you their holy sibling, are born of God, born of the Spirit. Therefore, you are a son, S-U-N. Now, if we consider the sun, the star or the sun that we have actually illuminating our solar system or illuminating the earth, how many of us here can actually look up at midday at the sun? 
without having your retinas damaged. Could anyone here do that? Without some artificial assistance. You can't even look at the sun, much less approach the sun. If you approach the sun, what happens? You burn. Yeah? As we are on the topic of burning, now before we go across there, go across with me to Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. I just want to nail this part down. This is the second way we're laying here, right? Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. All right, it should be there now. And it reads, now this is actually Malachi prophesying about Jesus, the Christ. And he says, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wing. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Pay attention. And take note that the word son there is not S-O-N, but, but S-U-N. Son. And it reads, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise. Which means Malachi actually identifies that Christ Jesus is a son. An S-U-N. A son. Therefore, if Christ is in you and you are born of God. You are in Christ. You are you identify yourself with Christ in Christ. You are a S U N. Do you know that in the scripture it actually says that the enemies of God melt at the presence of God, whom you are? Let's go to Psalm 86. Sorry, Psalm 68. Go back across to Psalm 68. Let's jump across. All right, so it says from verse 1 Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee from before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Do you realize that this verse here is telling you that you are born of God. You are a son, an S-U-N, just like Father, just like Christ Jesus, who will you are multiplication of Christ Jesus. So you are you are you are S U N. And the wicked, evil, blows away like smoke from before you and melts like wax. What happens if you put wax out in the sun during the day? What will happen to it? Type the answer in the chat room. What will happen to the what will happen to the wax? My beloved sister, Patty, thank you for posting those verses there for me. That's very helpful for me and for everyone else. Right? If you actually leave wax out in the sun, what happens? Exactly. It melts. <laughs> right? You realize that this is actually saying that evil will melt like wax. At the presence of God? Are you not born of God? Born of the Spirit? And, a, and are a son, an S-U-N, because the Spirit, the, Spirit of, the Spirit of God is a son, an S-U-N? You are a consuming fire. What is the sun? The sun is a consuming fire in the sky. See, what if? 
son in the sky was actually placed there by father as a reminder as to what he is and what you are in the kingdom. Give it some thought. Think about it. Yeah? Think about it. What if the sun, the S-U-N, is there in the sky to remind you on a daily basis as to what you are in the kingdom? As to the reality of God and the reality of your position in God, with God, as a son of God, daughter of God. Yeah? Diana said, Diana Jameson says, son is light energy. Yes, it is. It is fire. Do you know that first John chapter 1 verse 5 that says God is light? That the word translated light there actually means firelight. Why? Because the scriptures indicate that God is a sun, S U N. Now tell me, isn't the demonic realm darkness? <laughs> Eh? Exactly, Jennifer. That is why Jesus said that you are the light of the world. Because you are a son. A S-U-N. <laughs> right? Do you, would, would you like to see where that is reflected? Go across now. Go across to, with me to Revelation 21. Let's go across Revelation 21. See, these things are in front in front of you, and you may have been reading it and not actually taking note of what it is actually saying. Right? Revelation 21, we're reading from verse 22, and it reads, I saw no temple in it. Now, this is actually concerning the New, New Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty, he said the, the word Lord can also be interchange with spirit. It, so it's, it'll say for the spirit, God Almighty, the omnipotent ruler of all and the lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun nor of the moon to give light to it. For the glory, the splendor, the radiance of God has illumined it and the lamb is its lamp and light. In other words, the lamb is an internal sun, an S-U-N inside of the New Jerusalem. If there is no external sun anymore, the Son of God, the Lamb, is the S-U-N, the sun, which is giving light to the New Jerusalem. That right there, Revelation 21, verse 22 and 23, explains you as a son of God. And, I, and pun intended, <laughs> as an S-O-N and, a, and an S-U-N. Let's read on. It says, and the, the city has no need of the sun nor of the moon to give light to it. For the glory, the splendor, the radiance of God has illumined it. And the Lamb is its lamp and light. The nations, the redeemed people from the earth will walk by its light. How is the nations walking by its light? Read on. And the kings of the earth will bring into it their glory. By day, for there will be no night there. There can be no night in this, in this scene right here. Because the sun is internal. For there to be night, the sun has to be external. And the earth revolving, rotating on its axis. So some persons would be in the sunlight, one part of the world, one, one side of the, of the globe can, can actually receive light at a time. Yeah? So there's no, there's, no, there's no night there. Its gates will never be closed in fear of evil. And they will bring the glory, the splendor, the majesty, and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing that the fires or profanes or is unwashed would ever enter it. 
know, anyone who practices abominations and lying, but only those will be admitted whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Continue. Listen to what chapter 22 says. Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, and of the Lamb, Christ, in the middle of its street. Sorry, I read that wrong. And the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb of Christ in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will, be, there will no longer exist anything that is cursed because sin and illness and death are gone. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bond servants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and long devotion. They will be privileged to see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. His name, the name of the Lamb, Christ, will be on their foreheads. Yeah? Won't you baptize, christen, and given his name? Okay? They will be privileged to see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be night. Listen up to verse 5 of chapter 22 of Revelation. There will be no longer, and there will no longer be night. They have no need for lamplight or sunlight. Because the Lord God will illumine them. <laughs> Pay attention. And there will no longer be night. They have no need for lamp light or sunlight. Talking about you, the saint, when you come into Christ, they have no need for lamp light nor sunlight. Because the Lord God, the Spirit of God, will illumine them, will illumine you. And you will reign as kings forever and ever. That right there, holy siblings, actually identifies that you are a son. A S-U-N. Now I want you to identify two things concerning the sun in this context. Without us having to get astronomical. Two things that we identify in this context. Number one. Is there any darkness in the sun? Is there any darkness in the sun? In the present sun? Yes! <laughs> Blessings, holy brother. Pleasure to have you here again tonight. Is there any darkness in the sun? No. That is why it is written in scripture in 1 John chapter 1, 5 that God is light, is fire light. In other words, God is a sun, S-U-N, and there is no darkness in him. You, as being born of God, are spiritual sons, S-U-N, S-U-N-S, sons. That is exactly what Revelation 22 verse 5 is seeing, is actually showing. If you're following that, type sun, S-U-N. Now, why is she doing that? The two things that I actually want to identify with regards to the sun, number one, is that there is no darkness in the sun. Therefore, there is no darkness in you. Number two, sorry, well, the other half of number one is that there can be no darkness. When there is, um, there can be no darkness around the sun. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. There can be no darkness around the sun. So then, why would it, why would any son of God, any saint, even entertain the thought that a devil, a demon, an evil spirit, entities of darkness, 
can even approach you. Think about it. Give it some thought. Great, I'm seeing everybody saying son. Give it some thought. If you are a son, and there can be no darkness around the sun because it is firelight. It is brilliant light. It is light that consumes. That's why it's called a consuming fire. Why would you even entertain the fact that a demon spirit, a dark spirit, can even, even approach you? Number two, Anything that approaches the sun is consumed and destroyed. It, is, it, it burns. It, it burns. It literally is inflamed and incinerated. We just saw that Psalm 68 says that the wicked or the darkness melts like wax in the presence of God. <laughs> are we beginning to see uh, um, are we beginning to see how illogical it is to be afraid of devils to be afraid of satan hold on come in come in <laughs> Are coming, Hermana Santa Senior. <laughs> Pleasure to have you here tonight, Holy Sister. Pleasure to have you here tonight. All right, we have missed you. All right, so are coming. Let's actually, um, we we identify one that there is light. The sun is light. And there is no darkness in it. Therefore, you have, it is illogical to even entertain the thought that darkness can even dwell around you, or on you, or in you. <laughs> Think about it. Give it thought. You are a consuming fire because you are born of the consuming fire. So if you are born of the consuming fire, you are consuming fire. And second, and which brings us to the second point, that anything that approaches the sun is incinerated at a great distance. Do you realize that is why the Bible says that God is a sun and shield? <laughs> and that your faith is called the shield of faith because faith is a mental picture. In other words, faith is mental acceptance being true or real. Therefore, faith is the shield of faith is the shield of your mental image of God as a refuge of light. Let's go back to Psalm 91. <laughs> if you're following that type, shield of faith. If you're following that, type shield of faith. Let me just see your responses. So let me say we, you actually have the shield of faith. The shield of faith is the shield of your mental image of the spirit as the fortress, as your fortress of light. According to Psalm 91 and Psalm 27. <laughs> Great. So everybody is following that. Everybody is following that. All right. So, great. So now, let's take it up a notch. Yes, yes, yes. So we end it? No. It's just the third layer. <laughs> That's just the third layer. 
right? So, so far, we identify that if you dwell in the spirit or the mental image of the Most High, who is light, as your light, and that he is your fortress of light. So I asked you all just now to actually give it some thought. Imagine that you're in a fortress and the fortress is made out of light. It's pure, brilliant, white light. That fortress is actually the Spirit of God. Your fortress. Your refuge. So you're in this, this fortress is actually, you're in this fortress. And that fortress is actually emanating from you. The sun, the S-U-N, just as it's actually emanating from Jesus, the Lamb, in Revelation 21. Because he, just like you, are illuminating the, illuminating the creation. Think about it. That's why Jesus said that you are the light of the world. Because according to Revelation 22.5, you technically do not need a sun. You don't need lamplight, nor do, nor do you need sunlight. Because the Spirit of the Lord illumines you, making you a sun, a S-U-N, in the Spirit realm. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, you have no right even entertaining darkness. Any entertainment, any entertainment of darkness here is entertaining a lie. And as a matter of fact, I would go this far to say that Peter actually said, and I always refer to this, he said to build the loins of your mind. In all modern English, it would, it would, it would read, discipline the procreative thoughts of your mind. By this, looking at this scripture, and you see that Zain didn't make this up. By looking at this, you realize that Zain, that that actually are tormented or being attacked are allowing it themselves because they are entertaining a, they're entertaining a lie. And because they are in Christ, and to have the Spirit of God is to have the mind of God, the all-powerful, the all-powerful, divine mind, the creative mind, they are actually creating their torment. Yes, you're creating it because your mind is unrenewed. Is everybody following that? Type discipline. This is why the Apostle Paul actually says, the Apostle Paul actually says to keep your mind on, thing, on things above habitually. Yeah? Keep your mind on things above habitually. Paul, my brother. <laughs> awesome having you in the house, bro. <clears throat> I just want to make sure that's not missing any comments here. Discipline. Yeah? But we ain't finished there. <laughs> let's, let's put the fourth layer on top of that. So, so far we see how illogical it is for any saint to even entertain the thought of darkness being able to come close to you. Because you are S-U-N. And if the S-U-N out there that you see cannot, does not tolerate anything coming into close proximity. It, 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 literally, in, it, it literally incinerates it. Or um, the fact that there is no darkness in the sun in itself. Therefore, for anybody to say, any saint, any son of God, to say that he or she can be demon possessed is to say that you are light and there is darkness in you. Darkness equals evil. Evil equals darkness. God is light and in him there is no darkness. <laughs> you 
you are born of God, therefore you are light. And in you there is no darkness. For any son of God to say that he can be possessed is to say that that first John chapter 1 verse 5 is a lie. Right? By, 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 by even by, um, by making that assertion is spitting in the Apostle John's face. And you're spitting in Jesus' face because he says you are the light of the world. In other words, you are the son, the internal son of the world, according to Revelation 22.5. They didn't make that up. It's in your Bible. <laughs> oh, Lord. Notice how we're taking that doctrine, that religious folly, and are crumpling it up. I'm taking it in your backyard, throwing some gas on that. That is what it's good for. Throw some diesel on that. So it ain't gonna burn fast. It ain't gonna burn long. <laughs> and light that. Fire burn that. Because <laughs> you're entertaining lies. Yeah? You're entertaining lies. <laughs> you are, according to Revelation chapter 22, 5. Yeah? But he says we are a spark of the main flame, like a chip of the block. I even didn't say a spark party. I say that you are a multiplication of the flame. <laughs> you are the flame multiplied because it's the full spirit you have. Think about it. It's the whole you have. All of the spirit that you have. Therefore, you are not a spark. You are the full flame in a different body, in a different form. Yeah? <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> Give it some thought. Give it some thought. Hey, Shelley. Blessings, my dear cousin. <clears throat> Pleasure to have you here tonight. Yeah? Think about it. Give it some thought. See, you are a replica of your father. <laughs> right? Paul says, so good was powerful. There is no darkness, no sun. Come on, Jesus. Exactly. You just can't go in the darkness. What? That meaning it's impossible for you to have darkness in you because in you. Because Jesus is in you. Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, you mentioned that, Paul. <laughs> Let me go across to 2 Corinthians 6. <laughs> yeah? Let me go across to 2 Corinthians 6. So everybody that thinks that devils could come on you, we just kill that. One time. No sticking. <laughs> yeah? 2 Corinthians 6. We're reading from verse. 14, it says, do not be unequally bound together with unbelievers. Oh, this we, That is a topic in itself, but we're not talking about that. Follow the verse. Do not make mismatched alliances with them inconsistent with your faith. So pay attention to the questions that Paul is asking here. Paul, that, 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 that Paul is asking. For what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness? Okay. What fellowship can light have with darkness? Pay attention. What harmony? Notice he said harmony. You see, if you demon possess, what you actually saying is that a devil is living in harmony with the Spirit of God. What harmony can there be between Christ and Satan? I could flip this table with that. <laughs> I could flip the table and say, that is it, goodbye. <laughs> what harmony? So then, for everybody that's actually thinking about the fear of picking up some spirit because you step out in Halloween night or not going around the witches you're afraid to be around a witch. 
You are afraid to be wrong, to, to be around the voodoo practitioner. You are afraid to be around, to, to be around a Satanist because you'll open a door. Open what door? Your back door? <laughs> what? The side door? The glass door? No. You, when is the last time you see a dawn the sun? <laughs> Come on, man. When is the last time you hear a dawn in the sun? The S-U-N. <laughs> eh? When was the last time you see a door in the sun? Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. Didn't the Bible say that didn't 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 John also say that just as Jesus is, so are we in this world? One of the reference points that I always use as a good gauge of doctrine, a simple and quick and efficient way to identify the veracity of a doctrine. That if somebody comes and tells me anything that that is dangerous, my first question to myself is, is that dangerous for Jesus? If it is not dangerous for Jesus, it is not dangerous for me. I say again, if the Bible says just as Jesus is, so are we in this world. And somebody comes and tells you, hey, a devil could jump on you. You have to stay away from that. It could open doorways in your life. If just as Jesus is, so are you in this world. Ask yourself this question. Could a doorway be open to Jesus? Could a devil jump on Jesus? Could Jesus be possessed? And if your answer is no, then you have the answer for yourself. If you believe anything contrary to that, your reference point is not Christ. Your reference point is something external. Because the Spirit of God, as we saw in Revelation, as well as Psalm, is a son, a S-U-N. Therefore, you are S-U-N. And darkness cannot approach the sun. <laughs> Lord Jesus. <laughs> the reason why the reason why a devil could affect a saint, it is because the saint with his undisciplined mind has technically given the devil or, or is actually empowering, creating the reality. Let me just, let me not use the word empowering, but you're creating the reality. You're creating your own darkness. <clears throat> that is why Peter says, discipline the procreative force of your mind. Why would he tell you discipline? To discipline it. It is because if it is indisciplined, your procreative force can create hellish realities. Give it thought. Yes? Cheryl, 100 kilometers alone? <laughs> Think about it. 100 kilometers, I mean, I, I know you've been actually using it metaphorically, yeah, but think about it, everyone. <clears throat> the devil would burn not only in 100 kilometers alone. In it. How much mile is the earth from the sun? A calculation of at least, uh, and I approximate, 96,000 miles from the sun. And we feel the heat at 96,000 miles. And even if the even if do you know that if the layer, the ozone layer around the Earth is destroyed. The sun will incinerate this planet. 
like that. The waves of fire is actually flowing. See, watch the sun that you have. For those of you who are actually not familiar with a little astronomy, I suggest that you actually look into it and see the nature of the sun that is giving it light. And pay attention to how it functions because the writers of the scriptures use the sun as a reference point for the realities of God. It is as if, as I said, the sun is created to, to remind the sons as to the spiritual reality their father's reality, and their spiritual reality. So much that in, Re in Revelation it says that, the, that within the new Jerusalem, within, in the new covenant, the sons of God will not lead, need lamplight or sunlight, but they are illumined and illumining, and they will illumine the creation because they are the sons, the S-U-N. Now there is no darkness in it. Therefore, Cheryl, my beloved holy sister, this devil can't touch you at at least, let's say at least 96,000 miles. <laughs> <clears throat> he can't even throw a pebble to reach, to, to reach close to you. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. Yes, Sherry. Ark of the Covenant was to, to those who wouldn't support it. Yes, Sherry. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So, so far, you see how illogical it is. If you actually see how illogical it is to think that darkness can approach your light or could touch you, type illogical in the chat, room, in, 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 in the chat window. Type illogical. Before, before I actually rest down the fourth layer, the fourth layer is where we seal it off. Type illogical layer for me. There we go. <laughs> there we go. As you say in China. Here we go. <laughs> Illogical. All right. All right. So, the question is, why are you afraid? Because you are the sun, the S-U-N, and the Spirit of God is shining from you into the creation. You exist as a sun, a, S -U a, a, a S U N, and that light, that mental image of the light, is your fortress. Do you realize that that means that for, for evil to pass, to actually reach you, it has to pass through the spirit first. It has to pass fortress first before it could touch this body. Think about it. Right. Before we touch the last layer, go across, go back to Psalm 91. Yeah, the last layer in particular, I want to rest that down on you just now. Go back to Psalm 91. Now let's see what Psalm 91 actually has to say about this fortress that you are in, this live fortress that is around you, this mental image of light, this fortress of light, mental image of the fortress of light that is alive. It is all powerful. It is actually all around you and shining from you. Let's see what it says. So we read verse 1 now, continuing this now in the Amplified Vision. And it says, I will see of the Lord, verse 2. So we read, let's read from verse 1. Now, for now I'm going to personalize Psalm 91. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the psalm. Therefore, if you're reading the psalm, you don't read the Psalms in the future tense anymore. Because they read the Psalms in the future tense because they were following the law. They had to fulfill the law. And only if they fulfill the law, then they would actually benefit from the promise. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, as he himself said. Therefore, as Paul put it in, in, in Romans chapter 8, 
that the righteous and just requirements of the law are fulfilled in us. So we do not read the Psalms futuristically, we read the Psalms as a present reality. So we read it in present tense. I'm going to personalize it. Right? You all can personalize it after me. And it would read, I, who dwell in the mental image of the Most High, the mental image of light of the Most High, will remain, and, will remain secure and rest in the light of the Almighty, whose power no enemy can withstand. See, this psalm here is now telling you that once you live, David, once you live in the mental image of the light of the Lord as your fortress, this fortress of light that is emanating from you, it is, a, it is the power that the enemy can, cannot withstand. That is because, so basically that fortress is the power of God that is around you. Right? Jesus said you're the light of the world. Therefore, that power is in all of the world, all of creation. Go on. I will say of the Spirit of the Lord, or the mental image of the Lord, as my light. You are my refuge and my fortress. My God, in whom I trust with great confidence, and on whom I depend. See, it's telling you how to manifest this. I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress. My God or my reference point in whom I trust with great confidence and on whom I rely, on whom I depend. So what is he saying? Depend on the power of God that is emanating in this fortress from you. For he will save me from the trap of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Right? Talking about diseases here now. He will cover me and completely protect me with his pinions. He will replace pinions there and say the spirit. He will cover me and completely protect me with his spirit. And under his wings or his spirit, because it's the wings of the spirit, will I find refuge. His faithfulness, the light, is a shield and a wall. Pay attention. But this is actually saying that that light, that mental image of the light, dwelling in the mental image of the light, of the spirit of, of the mental image of the Lord as your light, shining as a fortress of light, you actually make, making you a sun, an S-U-N, that that light, the sun, the sunlight is a shield and a wall as his faithfulness. Because of that, he says, I will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction of sudden death that lays waste at noon. So in this, it actually says that you, because you dwell in the, the light, the mental image of the light of the Lord. That is your refuge. A live refuge. Made of the spirit. Live light. Live spirit. That you don't have to be afraid of the terror of the night. Nor of the hour that flies by day. Nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness. Nor of the destruction of sudden death that lays waste at noon. So sudden calamity, you could relax yourself. Listen up. A thousand may fall at my side. Oh, a lot of people read it and think that that is actually referring to right at your right at your side. Or 10,000 at my right hand. But look at the next verse. But danger will not come near me. Therefore, where are they falling? If the danger is not near you, where are they falling? They are falling away from you. A great distance from you. And he goes on to say, I will only be a spectator as I look on at my eyes and see the divine repayment of the wicked because they cannot pass through that fortress. Because, pay attention, because I have made this 
spirit of the Lord or the mental image of the Lord or mental image of the light of the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, my dwelling place, no evil befalls me, nor does any plague come near me, because he commands his angels in regard to me to protect and defend and guard me in all of my ways. Psalm 91. Why are you afraid? That just says there, the promises that the sons of God are sons, as we just saw, S-U-N-S. And the light of the Lord is the fortress. The spirit is the light. The light is the spirit. It is a live fortress. And your mental, that is actually activated and is present by your mental imagery of it. <laughs> now tell me, is the devil supposed, are you supposed, are you afraid of the devil? Or is the devil who is darkness supposed to be afraid of the sun? Because the S-U-N in the sky eliminates darkness. Darkness cannot dwell in the sun, in the S-U-N, in the sky. <laughs> Planets have to have a protective covering to dwell in the sun, or else the, the, the light of the sun, the fire, the heat of the sun, the rays of the sun will burn it to cinders. So are you supposed to be afraid of the devil? Or is the devil supposed to be afraid of you? Psalm 68. Is evidence of the effects, your effects on Satan. Let's, play, let's lay the last layer. Last layer. Go with me <laughs> to Revelation 18. Everybody following that? Type sunlight. Type that talking about party. You don't be afraid of anything. I will walk right next to this, isn't it? Walk up to the witch. Because you know why? Because everything that she has or the warlock has is standing in the presence of the spirit just by thought I lock it up <laughs> normal <laughs> right Grace Jacob pleasant pleasant pleasure to have you here tonight holy sister all right so everybody type in sunlight all right so let's go to the last layer. I'll put the fourth layer on top of that. I'll lay it like a cake. <laughs> right? This cake tall. Fourth layer. Let's go. As we say in China. There we go. <laughs> right? We're going to Revelation 18. Again, two seconds. One, one and a half, one and three quarter, one and ninety-nine of a hundred, <laughs> and two. So let's go. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. This is what it reads. Pay attention. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his splendor and radiance. Pause. Read it again. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his splendor and radiance. Do you realize that this verse actually establishes that the proportion of your light
goes hand in hand with the authority that you are given. Read it again. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing, possessing great authority. And the earth was illuminated with its splendor and radiance. Great authority is couplet. It is the same as actually having, actually, and the earth was illuminated with its splendor and radiance. Let's sink in. Let's soak in. Let's soak in how illogical it is. This doctrine that you need to be protecting yourself from the devil. Let's soak in. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> That's nothing <in> kick. <laughs> But it's in ice and time. Oh yeah. We put in the cherry on the cake too, party. <laughs> we put in the cherry on the cake too. Do you realize that Revelation 18 was one? Actually parallels authority, great authority with illumination. Let me put it like this. Because you are born of God who is the almighty and all-powerful and the greatest light and the brightest and strongest light, the strongest sun, S-U-N, in creation. It means, or actually, let me flip it before I take it that angle. Let's flip it. Let's take it from the authority side. Where are you seated in creation, in the kingdom? Type in the chat room. Where are you seated? I'm putting the cherry on top of the icing. The icing. Let's do it. Where are you seated in the kingdom? Ting, 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 ting. Let's hear your answers. Type in the chat window. Where are you seated in the kingdom? Are you not seated at your right hand? Aha. Yes, Patty. Shall you in Christ? In heavenly places. Yes. But he says right hand of God. Exactly. Is, is not God the highest? If God is the highest, type highest. Right, Chris says in Christ. Pauline says in heavenly places. Yes. Right hand of the Father in Christ. Yes. Right hand. On the right hand side of God. Yes. Right hand of God in Christ in heavenly places. Awesome. Isn't Father the Most High? And if He's the Most High and you're seated on the right hand of God, is there any elevation of God by with his right hand? No, there is not. The right hand, God and his right hand are exactly in the same place. There is no elevation of one above the other. Pay attention. <laughs> are grinding that doctrine and burning it. With some gas and some diesel. <laughs> right? We burn it with some diesel and some gas. Right? Therefore, Father, you are actually seated and equal with the Father. There is no elevation of one above the other. You are seated equally with the Father. I am not... <clears throat> yeah? Now seeing Don Allen. Pleasure to have you tonight, bro. Pleasure to have you here tonight. All right? So you're seated equally with the Father. Therefore, 
just as Jesus, it is stated in, in, in the New Testament that Christ has been elevated far above all principality and power, above all rulers. He is above all, above all realms, above all authorities. So he is the authority of the authorities. Seated the right hand. And you are seated in him. You are seated the right hand of the Father. You are a son, an S-O-N and an S-U-N. According to what you read in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, it says great authority and it was paralleled with illumination. It illuminated all of the earth. Yeah, that's what it says in Revelation 18.1. Therefore, do you realize that the great authority, the highest authority that you have, actually means that you have the greatest light in all of creation. You are the strongest light, equivalent to the Father. Which means, that even angels, and they do not have the authority to approach you as a son of God. Now pay attention to what I'm saying. In other words, the authority is reflected in the light. If you read Revelation 18, you'll notice that it says, great authority, and it is paralleled with illumination. Therefore, and pay attention because I'm going somewhere with this. The Bible says, yes, Shari, it says, just as he is, so are we in this world. Therefore, what it is actually showing is, actually, that, is that the higher the authority, the greater the illumination. Which means that if you are one Holy Spirit with Christ Jesus, joint heir. You, just as he is, so are you. Therefore, you are a multiplication. One Holy Spirit with Christ Jesus. This would mean that you're, you are the highest authority which means that your illumination is greater than every other creation that exists. Do you know that that would mean that anything that is below your authority by nature, pay attention to what I'm saying, you know, by nature, by nature, I'm saying it for the third time, by nature, the lesser light by nature, cannot approach the greater light? Think about it. Which means that even angels, they are actually in lower authority. You actually have authority over them. Which means that the angelic light is less than your light. <laughs> If authority is reflected in illumination and you are the uh, you are actually see the right hand of the Father who is the most high, the highest authority, then just as he is, so are we in this world. It would indicate that your light is greater than any other light. And the lesser light would not be able to actually approach you as the greater light. Right? Now that I've actually laid that down, it would also indicate <laughs> right, that, well, before I hit that, let's actually just point out that that would mean that no devil from hell, no demon spirit, no evil spirit, no whatever entity of darkness that you would like to refer to even has the ability or the power to approach you. 
if the angels are less in authority and they are light are lesser than your light in Christ and you and they actually they, their light actually puts them in a position where just like um just like in the animal kingdom you have th that is actually reflected in the animal kingdom in the animal kingdom you'll notice that a hyena does not necessarily approach a lion it is fearful to approach a lion that's because the energy the spirit of the lion is greater than the spirit of the is greater than the spirit of the hyena it recognizes authority <laughs> if you put it in scriptural context you would say that the light of the lion is greater than the light of the hyena and by nature the hyena is um has an inability to aggress the lion it is not that the lion it's not that the the the, the hyena um or should i say by nature the, the hyena has respect because that in the spiritual context the light of the lion is greater than the light of the hyena so if the hyena is angry with the lion by nature he actually has to bow to the authority yes yeah? in the same context you being in unity with christ one holy spirit of christ jesus is actually a son just like him actually a multiplication of him because you have the fullness of the spirit you are complete in christ your multiplication of him and if you are multiplication of him then even the angels bow to your authority and in that context why would you think that a demon spirit that has no power no authority notice it says no no authority therefore no illumination <laughs> if authority is equated with illumination and the devil has no authority it means to say that he has no illumination what where on this green earth do you think that any entity of darkness by nature can even approach you as a son of god as a as a son who is an sun think about it <laughs> pastor carrie <laughs> awesome to have you here tonight pastor blessings and much love <laughs> think about it if you're following that type greater light type in the chat room greater light it is illogical for any son of god to even entertain the fact that an entity of darkness apart from the fact that there is no darkness in the sun in the sun apart from the fact that there's no darkness in the sun even by the the structure of authority that is reflected in illumination according to the scripture it is totally and completely logical for any saint to say that a devil has the authority to run up on a greater light that's impossible is this making sense <laughs> Is this making sense? Type greater light. So we come back to the question: Why are you afraid? The devil cannot approach you because there is no darkness in you. Light has no fellowship with darkness. Christ has no fellowship with Satan or Belial. The sun. Um, John says that God is firelight, and in Him there is no darkness. And if you're born of God, then you're born of the firelight. You, if God is a sun and shield, you are a sun, and, and the light of the Lord is the shield. So, 
Why are you afraid? So, can any devil, now that we've actually laid those four layers, can any devil, demon spirit, even Satan, approach you or aggress you? Can you, de can you be demon possessed? Do you know where this is reflected in scripture? I want you all to go back to the scripture. <laughs> hey, let me pull it. As a matter of fact, let's read it. Because this is in the Bible. These things are in the scripture. Let's go to... Let me just pull that up there quickly. Let's go to um, Matthew. All right, let's end with this. <laughs> oh, Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Before we before we we bring this to its culmination, Matthew eight twenty eight. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you very much. All right, so Matthew Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Let me just pull that up. All right, Matthew 8, for reading from verse 28. And it reads, pay attention. We just identified that the Son of God is an S-U-N. Right? And according to Psalm 68, that they melt like that the that the enemy melts like wax at the presence of the Lord. So that's what it just said. Identified the fortress of light. That you are the sun and S U N and you do not need sunlight or lamplight because the Spirit of the Lord illumines you. The mental image so that mental image of the of this um, mental image of the of the Lord as light illuminating the fortress as the refuge in the fortress. We just identified also that light, great authority, is paralleled with illumination. Therefore, the greater the authority, the greater the illumination, and which means that your illumination is greater than all illumination. Your energy is greater than all energy in all of creation. This is what John was referring to when he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. <laughs> See, the sons of God don't realize that those who are, in, who are not in Christ, who are not in fellowship with Christ, this is another aspect. Pay attention. This is, an, this is another aspect of the Christ's walk that a lot of people think that they're subject to curses and incantations and witchcraft and spells that some 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 in the Christian body they hear, they say don't go there because they could put a curse on you or this one spoke an incantation on me and is and I actually have to be broken free and break the chains of the darkness break the chains and set 
once satalala. <laughs> you want to break the chains. But Jesus said, sorry, John said, greater is he that is in you, that is in us, than he that is in the world. Therefore, your spirit is greater than all other spirits. Your light, your authority is the highest authority. Why are you afraid of someone who is, who is not in fellowship with Christ? Doing incantations, doing witchcraft, um, speaking curses at you. It is not logical. It, is, it does not make sense. Because you, you are actually, your illumination is greater than those persons. Therefore, their words are subject and are subject to your authority. As fast as they speak it, number one, there is no darkness in you. You are light with the Father, in the Father, and there is no darkness in you. Therefore, that cannot even come if we use the distance of the sun to the distance of the sun from the earth that cannot even reach 96,000 miles close to you. Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> Give it thought. All right? That cannot even get there. And, and even if it was, even if, which it is not, but even hypothetically speaking, that it was had the ability to actually get anywhere close to you. Your illumination is greater than their illumination. Therefore, by nature, the, you are, they are like hyenas and you are the lion. Who do you think has the authority? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Therefore, there is nothing that any other spirit any other being in creation can do that you are subject to. You are subjected to it by choice or by your own ignorance. This is why Paul said in Philemon 6 to that the communication of your faith will become effective and powerful by your accurate knowledge of what is ours in Christ. And why Peter said in First Peter to gird the loins of your mind, or as I said in our modern English, it would read to discipline the procreative force of your mind. Right? So we just identified that this, that you are a son, an S-U-N, and that your authority makes you the greatest light in all of creation, with Christ, in Christ, with the Father equal to the Father, and that the enemies of the Lord, the wicked, the evil, melts like wax at the presence of the Lord. Therefore, we can safely say that all devils are tormented by your presence as a son of God, a S-O-N, who is a S-U-N. Right? <laughs> if you're following that, If you're following that, <clears throat> type amen. Now, why is he doing that? Let's, let's read from Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Let's see the evidence of this in Jesus. And it says, just make sure. We're wrapping up. We're wrapping up, Patty. <laughs> We're wrapping up. <clears throat> All right? So it says, when he arrived at the other side in the country of the gathering, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs met him. Now listen to what the devils are actually telling him. They were so extremely fierce and violent that no one could pass by the way. And they screamed out. Now notice the demons did not actually speak. Say, hey, Jesus... What are you doing here? You come to torment us before the time out. No, they screamed out. 
If they're screaming, logically, think about it. If they're screaming, it means to say that his presence is tormenting them. It is causing torment. He is a son, the S-U-N, and it is causing torment. They screamed. They, and they screamed out, what business do we have in common with each other, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the appointed time of judgment? See, they were experiencing the torment of his presence. Some, some distance from a large herd of pigs was, some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was grazing. The demons began begging him, why? Authority, his light is greater, his illumination is great. 